I was born in a small district of Soviet Riga with um, roughly 25,000 predominantly Russian-speaking neighbors. A district not dissimilar to many other residential areas of Soviet Latvia. It was my small world, my bubble, my comfort zone. Similar people and their similar stories, the same language, the same outlook, similar furniture from one flat to another, books and friends who you inherit from your parents, and even similar aspirations and hopes for the future that back then felt quite predictable and therefore very safe. My bubble cracked for the first time when I changed to a school in the city center and then later went to a university where the majority of students were ethnic Latvians, communications with whom um, enabled me to open up to a new perspective on Latvian society and also start to re-evaluate where I come from and how do I fit in this wider Latvian context. I moved from a very closed, wholly Russian-speaking environment to a more open, bilingual world. My social network grew larger and larger and more diverse, new friends, from cultural and economic backgrounds different from mine. New stories, some of which contradicted to the worldview I was so familiar with. The collapse of the Soviet Union, which happened approximately around the same time, contributed to this increasing ambiguity of the environment I was exposing myself to, but also helped me realize that any status quo can be challenged. I started to appreciate the diversity of Latvian society, and I started to learn back then something that would serve me very much in the future in what I do today in London. I started to learn that in our complex and interconnected world, there is hardly ever one single truth, and that we all contribute with our personal experiences to creating a more complete understanding of this world and ourselves in it. Later, after university, I lived abroad in a few different cities, Copenhagen, Paris, Brussels, Bristol, and now London. And as I was moving around and I was changing the view from my window, I was opening up to still more different cultures and uh, ways of being. And each interaction with unfamiliar challenged what I used to know raised a new question, reflection on which added yet another puzzle piece to my understanding, to my awareness of myself in this society. For example, how the history of a small nation like Denmark can help me better understand the history of my country, of Latvia. Or considering the historically developed relations between Russia and France, how this can help me in building my relations with my French friends today? Or can the imperial heritage of London can help me understand why I feel welcomed there more than anywhere else abroad? My ability to thrive in this foreign environment and my sustainability, if you wish, depended on my openness and willingness to understand and to adapt to constantly changing conditions around me. And similarly, on a social level, the sustainability of our society depends on our openness, on our willingness to coexist and to collaborate with respect for each other and the planet. Because the problems that we face today, be it the refugee crisis, global warming, increasing inequality, just to name a few, these problems are too complex to be understood, let alone to be tackled in isolation, when acting in isolation tends to aggravate existing problems and create new ones. So today, I'm bringing this awareness, this thinking that I've been developing over the last 20 years to my work, to what I do today in London. I'm bringing this awareness, helping large organizations 
big established businesses to understand their social purpose in this society and burst their bubbles in which they operate and reconnect them with society that I believe they are here to serve. There is hardly anyone who is left aside from commenting on what is wrong with the corporate economy today. Even Pope Francis challenged what capitalism has become and its values, greed, self-interest, and this dominating vision on might is right. It just takes to open any newspaper today to see the consequences of this attitude. Tax avoidance, cheating on emissions tests and medical research results, excessive executive salaries and bonuses, you name it. But is this the reason why these companies exist? Is this the reason why these companies were established in the first place? And this, is this why all these people who make up these large organizations wake up in the morning and go to work every day from day to day? Because if we look at it, many of these large organizations who are, that are being accused of wrongdoing today, they were once social enterprises. Yes, because most company founders had a very strong belief and will to contribute to the betterment of our society with their business ideas, be it through fighting disease, connecting ideas and people around the world, fostering economic growth, or meeting the need for affordable and healthy products. As these companies were growing larger and larger, becoming more and more complicated to manage and creating more and more bureaucracy around them and finally becoming overwhelmed by it, people within these companies started to move away from the initial social purpose and miles away from, from the society and its needs in response to which these companies were actually created. There is one interesting study that says the closer we live to the ground, the better our connection with the local community. Isn't it ironic that the higher someone's position is in a corporate hierarchy, the higher their office is in a company's building? But how often the senior executives do look out their windows to see what's going on in society today? Well, very often when people ask me what I do as my job, what is my job, I very often explain that my colleagues and I, we help people within these corporations to look out their windows and together make sense of what they see out there, but also establish their relation to it. So with this thinking in mind and our aspiration uh, to improve corporate culture, my colleagues and I, we've been helping these this companies to understand what's going on in society. And as I had have to do for myself when I was living in different foreign environments, I now help large organizations to establish a dialogue with different social stakeholders. Because I believe that this dialogue is instrumental for cross-sector collaboration and social innovation. Well, moreover, a dialogue is already collaboration. Let me explain. Since 1970s, we have dramatically increased our use of the words partner and partnership. But at the same time, and I think you would agree with me, we are miles away from building truly equal and effective partnerships, be it across different age groups, genders, cultures, or faith communities, or across all these groups altogether. So I think that the problem is partly because we see a dialogue as an enabler for further actions, as a tool for further collaboration. When we are engaged in a practice of exchange of ideas, opinions, views, we are already shaping each other's thinking and we are already contributing to completing each other's understanding of the human condition and the nature of things. So in a way, we are already collaborating when we are talking to each other. So with this thinking in mind, I want to give you one practical example of how we've been bringing senior leaders and representatives of other social groups in one, in one space, in one physical space, in order 
just to talk and by talking to create a shared understanding of what we want a society together and how we can make it happen in our own respective fields or collectively. A professional service firm started to question itself whether what's the purpose of accountancy today in a world with a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, in a world where even the most equal economies report growing inequality. What, is there a way for a tax and financial advisory firm to contribute to building a more prosperous economy and a more financial inclusive society? So what do you do? How do you create this understanding and how you understand your contribution to this purpose, to this vision? Well, first of all, if you're truly passionate about your contribution to social good, you do not define it in isolation in a closed boardroom with a group of white, middle-aged male executives. You go out and you engage in a conversation with the diversity of our society that is out there, which would help, help you to create a more complete understanding and define prosperity from the point of view of the whole society. And we help these senior executives to go out of their bubbles, both metaphysically, but also physically. For example, our next discussion will take place in Tower Hamlets. It's a borough in London, and it's one of the most unequal, in terms of income, areas probably in the UK, where Canary Wharf, the European financial district, is rubbing shoulders with a large amount of uh, social housing for people on, on low incomes. So in a way, it's already um, the embodiment of this divide that we are witnessing today in society and the embodiment of, of something that we would like to tackle together. The outcomes of these discussions are not a list of actions. When we talk to each other in our daily lives, we do not struggle to justify the validity of these conversations by a list of actions or next steps. So why should it be different here? The outcomes of these discussions is to bring people together, to help them meet in the middle, to better understand each other, and also create an understanding how they can contribute to a better society and a better future, where we all want to live together. And then to take this understanding and to relate to it, no matter what you do, no matter which decision you take later in your daily working life. In conclusion, I would like to invite to see these observations that I've been sharing with you, not merely as a tool for making businesses more sustainable and more purposeful, but as an invitation to engage in a wider, more inclusive dialogue. I believe that by talking more to each other and by trying to understand each other, by challenging ourselves and others, by asking questions, by creating more spaces for discussions about some of the pressing issues that we face today in society, but also by leaving space for small, less significant, but so human chats and, and small talks, we will be able to understand each other better and relate to each other. Yes, bubbles are safe, but can we really prosper in isolation? Whether we like it or not, we are part of a wider, complex world which forces us to outreach to each other and to look for solutions together. So I'd be glad to see if my experience would be of value in breaking some of the bubbles that still exist in this society today. Thank you.